Continuing our Q&A series, this is the Old School PC's Q&A for May of 2020. Now before you ask, you may notice that I'm a little scruffy and becoming a bit Cro-Magnon here around the chin. Uh, that's because I decided to take the time to see what my beard even looks like. I've never known what my beard looks like, and since I don't have to interact with anybody, at least not out in the real world, I figured now would be a good time to take a look. Uh, it turns out my beard is somewhat salt and pepper, a little more salt than pepper. So I don't know how long the beard experiment will last, um, but that's what's going on with that. Now, uh, this is a fairly long Q&A video. Uh, there are 12 questions, but they all have fairly complex answers. So for your benefit, I've put time indexes in the video description so that if you don't like a particular question, you can just skip to the next one. So with that, let's get started. Carlos Texiera asks, let's say you could go back in time and restart from the day your AT&T 6300 arrived. You can take three items of hardware to enhance your AT&T. What will you take with you? Uh, there's two ways to answer that. The practical way is I just take back and core i7 8700K and just not use the AT&T. Um, but I guess what you're really asking is, um, what would I take back that would be period appropriate? Something I have now that I didn't have then uh, to put in the 6300. Um, well, since we got our 6300 with no hard drive and with only 128K of RAM, there's the first two right off the bat. I would, have, I would bring back a hard drive and I'd bring back 512K of uh, DRAM chips so that just right out of the gate I could have a usable system. The third thing... Um, probably a 386 accelerator, just so that I could have the fastest system on the block. Carlos also asks, what's your favorite sound card for DOS PCs, and which one would you consider the best, considering compatibility, but also features? So, my favorite and the best are radically different answers. My favorite is the poor little sound card that never had a chance, the PC Mockingboard, which I have in the form of the Bank Street Music Writer card. Uh, the Bank Street Music Writer card was the Mockingboard for the PC, and it was created in uh, roughly 1985 or 1986, and it was in, included in a 1986 music composition package. This would m make this card predate the ad lib um, by about one year but um, only one program ever supported it. Uh, and it's incredibly rare, and uh, I believe I have the only known one. So uh, that would be my favorite. Now as for the card with the best compatibility and features, uh, for me the answer is very obvious, the Sound Blaster Pro. Yes, it's only capable of 8-bit output, and uh, in stereo it can only go as high as 22 kilohertz. So this may sound like a strange recommendation, but it is across the board compatible with just about everything. Um, it's compatible with AdLib, obviously, and not only that, but if you set it to IRQ2 and stick it in a machine, it will run even the very earliest Sound Blaster games, like uh, Tongue of the Fat Man, or Stellar Seven, or Rise of the Dragon. Those very, very early games that supported the Sound Blaster sometimes uh, didn't work very well with later cards in the series. They weren't programmed well, or whatever. So that's in fact what I have in the XT behind me. Now, the actual use for a Sound Blaster in an XT is very limited, but I still hold that uh, for pretty much playing almost anything. As long as the card, as long as the game or whatever it is you're running doesn't need 16-bit output, um, the most compatible card you can put in is a Sound Blaster Pro. Brassic Gamer asks, if the IBM PC was equipped with an 8086 instead of an 8088, what would 8088 miles per hour be able to do that it can't do on an 8088, and what would the demo have been called instead? That's an interesting question. The 8086 is slightly faster than the 8088 at the same clock speed because it has 16-bit access to memory instead of just 8-bit access. So a single word read can be done in four cycles, as opposed to on the 8088, you have to break it up into two word reads, which takes eight cycles. Uh, it also has a slightly longer prefetch queue, um, probably to compensate for that. It's six bytes instead of four bytes. 
To be honest though, it probably wouldn't have made too much of a difference. The speed difference between the 8086 and the 8088 is rather slight. It wouldn't have helped at all for any of the uh, multicolor stuff that we were doing. It wouldn't have helped at all with the raster bar effect that we had near the end. Um, if I say Kefren's bars, somebody's going to get mad at me, so I won't say Kefren's bars. Um, it would have slightly enhanced the speed of the Rotozoomer the most, I think, because that's a very memory-heavy effect. Um, might have given it one more frame per second, but really not a big deal. And as for what would the demo have been called? Probably 8086 feet underground. Probably. Route 42 asks, why does the VGA write modes not support a transparent color? What was IBM thinking? Well, uh, I know why he's asking that. It's because he's currently going through a VGA programming series on his own channel, link in the description. And um, honestly, I think it really just kind of comes down to the B in IBM. IBM is International Business Machines, not IGM, International Gaming Machines. Uh, the video hardware for VGA was designed for what business people needed, and they needed high resolution for graphs, and they needed high colors for uh, product demonstrations or presentations or something like that, and they uh, wanted to keep the cost down. So while you do have kind of transparency in 16-bit planar mode, I mean, if you just simply don't write to a plane, or if you're writing a, something to the plane that, you know, has a hole in it, um, that doesn't show up, although you have to arrange your palette properly to make sure you're not mixing colors or something. I mean, that's technically a transparent write, but um, I know what you mean, and it's just simply because IBM was trying to make a business-oriented graphics card uh, as cheaply as possible. Pietro Caruso asks several questions, so let's take them one at a time. How did you learn to program on MS-DOS? Uh, slowly and appropriately within the time frame I grew up in and those machines existed in. I started out learning, I actually started out learning Logo on an Apple II, so that's, that's not the best answer. On the PC, the first language I touched was the built-in BASIC. And from there, I wanted f my programs to run faster, and I wanted uh, cool features in the editor like syntax highlighting, so I discovered and used Quick Basic. And then when Quick Basic wasn't fast enough, I saw what some of my friends were doing in advanced programming courses in high school, and they were using Turbo Pascal 4 at the time. Um, 3 and 4, it depended on which of my friends I knew I was interacting with. And... Uh, Turbo Pascal just kind of, that's what really lit the, the fire under my butt because I looked at it and I'm like, I understand this. Like Turbo Pascal was created, Pascal was created as a learning language and it's effectively, you know, executable pseudocode. Like it's very readable. So I really took to that and I loved the Turbo Pascal IDE, which lets you single step through your source code and, and watch variables and set conditional breakpoints. It's a wonderful environment. And then when Turbo Pascal 7 came around and I learned that you could inline assembler as well as link to assembler modules, and I'd been dabbling with assembler there because I'd been taking uh, simple programs, very small little com files and uh, disassembling them or looking at them in debug and just slowly teaching myself assembler. I mean, that was it for me. So um, it's just, it was a slow, iterative process. And... Uh, you know, if you're interested and you're driven, um, you can do it too. It's, I know that programming for MS-DOS today may seem like some arcane thing that no one wants to do um, or that no one can tell you how to do, but if you just simply have perseverance and look through old materials, you too can teach yourself how to program for MS-DOS systems. His next question, which is your programming language of choice for DOS? Well, I already answered that. Uh, it's Turbo Pascal plus Assembler. Uh, the more programs I write in that environment, the more assembler they are and the less Pascal they are. But uh, it's just, it's a great environment. I mean, that environment is so cool. The Turbo Pascal 7 IDE is so cool that you can write uh, an external module in assembler, uh, assemble it from the IDE. If there's an error in the source, it will 
direct you to that error in the source, in the IDE, and then later, when you're single-stepping through your Pascal program, if you happen to branch into the assembler part, it will pull up the assembler line, and you're single-stepping through assembler. And there's a register window in the corner that shows you your registers and your, your instruction pointer. And it, I mean, it's a one-stop shop for writing performance-oriented applications on MS-DOS. And I always wondered why their Turbo C and Turbo C++ products weren't as cool as that. But uh, yeah, Pascal plus Assembler. Which is your favorite DOS computer in your collection? That's a loaded question, which I can answer the most simply by saying my very first computer. In 1984, my father was working for AT&T, and he purchased uh, AT&T's clone computer at the time, the AT&T PC 6300. And you're going to actually hear more about the, well, we've already heard about the 6300 earlier. You'll actually hear a little bit more about it later. Um, and the 6300 is really a clone of the Olivetti M24, which was a very popular uh, clone that came out of uh, Italy. And it was actually so popular there that it was OEM'd uh, three times, the AT&T 6300, the Xerox 6060, and the Logabax 1600. And the Logabax 1600 was, I think, unique to France. Um, but I have a 6300 being in the States, and I also have a Xerox 6060 being in the States, so I'm happy about that. Um, it's an 8 MHz 8086. It's slightly more than two times faster than the original PC. It's what I had for five years from 84 to 89. And I have very fond memories of that machine, and it pretty much gave me the career that I have today. How did you become a demo scener and or join the demo scene? So what happened with that whole timeline? Well, I was always fascinated by uh, track. I've always been fascinated by creating music on the PC because the PC back in the 80s is such a non-music friendly computer um, that anyone who did manage to do anything with it that was cool was a god. And I wanted to disassemble everything and figure out how it all worked so I could do it myself. Um, so that's what got me fascinated in Track Blaster in 1990, a very early, if not the probably the first mod player for the PC. I believe that's right. Um, and then in very late 1990, if not the first week of 91, uh, downloaded Space Pig's Mega Demo and f f discovered the demo scene, read the info file several times, and then went to try to find other demos on BBSs. And then around 92, I started making BBS intros in exchange for higher ratio or download credits on those BBSs, uh, if you remember what that is. And then uh, in 93, a lot of things happened, 93 and 94. Uh, my friend Brian and I tried to make a clone of Panic by Future Crew, and we didn't get too far, but uh, we had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, we created the Grind Music Player, which is a mod player that for at least for techno or electronic mods that are, you know, four to the floor, uh, displays people dancing in time to the music. And uh, also in 94, I believe it was when um, uh, George Mann, also known as Snowman of Hornet, uh, contacted me on the phone, actually. Um, well, first through email, but then on the phone, which was, was very strange talking to a senior on the phone because uh, in America there weren't a lot of seniors. And um, he contacted me to create the uh, results production for Music Contest 3. And because he'd seen, oh, and because he'd seen my work in Chromatics. So I also created a, a one-man show music disc. I didn't write the music, um, but I solicited the music from other people. So Chromatics is uh, another thing that happened in that, time, in that time frame. So I had three productions under my belt. Snowman contacted me, asked me, asked me to make the uh, Music Contest 3 results prod, and I did, and I became a member of Hornet at that time, and there you go. So at which level of that journey did I become a demo scener? I, that depends on your definition of a demo scener. Was it when I f discovered the scene? When it was, was it when I followed the scene? Was it when I made my own productions? Or was it when I joined a demo group? Uh, that depends on your definition. Dom asks, what led to the creation and eventual closure of Hornet? Also, impulse tracker or scream tracker? Well, I'll answer that second question first. 
Uh, what's better, Impulse Tracker or Scream Tracker? Come on, man, the answer's obvious. Fast Tracker 2. As for what led to the creation and eventual closure of Hornet, um, well, the creation, this is a long history, and I'm going to summarize it as quickly as I can. Uh, Hornet was a demo group that uh, is a demo group still, loosely, um, but it was a demo group that maintained, prim that whose primary function was to maintain the Hornet archive. The Hornet archive was, uh, at the time, the world's largest single repository of demo scene related material. Demos, intros, uh, BBS intros, intros, um, code, music, uh, mod players, and we also wrote a semi-weekly newsletter called Demo News. It was founded by Dan Wright, a.k.a. Paul Bearer, in, I want to say, 91, loosely. It was either 91 or 92. And it was originally just, it didn't really have a name when it was first started. It was just Dan Wright, you know, collecting all this stuff and putting out a weekly newsletter on what was new and added to the archive. Originally, it wasn't even the Hornet Archive. It was called the Hornet Archive later because the machine it resided on at his college was named Hornet. Earlier, I think it was called, I think it was on a machine called Wasp. The FTP archive was on Wasp. So at one point, I guess it was the Wasp archive. I could have those details wrong, but it solidified itself as the Hornet Archive when it was on the Hornet machine. And when um, Snowman contacted Dan Wright because he really loved what they were doing and I think he was also in college at the time and also had a fast internet connection to the FTP server. And so that's when it effectively became the Hornet Archive. And even as the Hornet Archive moved later in its life to CDROM.com, who wanted to host it in exchange for, I guess, advertising or the right to um, publish it on CD-ROMs or something, which used to be a thing back in the 90s, it retained its name, the Hornet Archive. So what led to the closure of Hornet? Um, it, the closure of the archive um, in 1997, I want to say almost, I think it was even September of 1997, all five of us at the time who were still actively maintaining it, at the very end, I think it was me, I hope I have this right, if not, I think Phoenix will correct me, um, it was myself, uh, Andy Voss, aka Phoenix, um, Brett Neely, aka Gravedigger or GD, George Mann, a.k.a. Snowman, and Dan Wright, a.k.a. Paul Bear. I believe those were the, the five of us. I think it was the five of us left at the end. And uh, it was just, it was a lot of work for, um, for, no, for no benefit. I mean, the benefit was to us and it was to the scene. But, you know, it was an awful lot of hard work. I had a baby. George was working on his career out in California. Uh, Brett had just graduated. I mean, it, our lives were changing and we just, it was a lot of work and we were tired and we couldn't do it anymore. Not only that, but scene.org started in that year in 1997 and they were doing a fantastic job and they still are 23 years later. So we saw that and we felt like, well, there's probably no need to have two competing groups uh, maintaining an archive of demo scene uh, productions. So we gave everything over to scene.org and uh, called it a day. And it, had a, it was a five-year run. It was a great run, 150 issues of demo news. Um, we hosted a lot of stuff, too, for people who couldn't have their own hosting at the time because hosting was really expensive. Um, we had both the ICE and, ANZ, and uh, ACID ANSI archives and gave them accounts, and they could manage their own archives and stuff at that time. So... I'm glad we did it, but we got burnt out after five years. V Westlife asks, is that a super VHS mini DVD combo deck I see? Why, yes. Uh, in particular, this is the JVC uh, SR VS30. So this is one of the models that has the built-in line-level time-based corrector. Um, it also has some memory, uh, so it can do a, a 3D comb filter. Um, I have all, I use it for, for uh, doing preservation work of VHS. And uh, I do use the line level 
time-based corrector, and I also pass it through this IDEN um, frame-based time-based corrector, and the two of those together gives me a very stable output. Now, unfortunately, this unit's been acting up, so I'm going to need to troubleshoot it, but when the two are both working, uh, I can capture VHS seven times in a row, and each frame is 100% accurate in the time frame that I do it. And that lets me do some really cool stuff, like taking five or seven different captures, overlaying them all together with transparency in Premiere, and you get completely free noise reduction. It's fantastic. That's what I use it for. And these are getting expensive these days. Um, to find one of these on eBay, you'd probably have to spend at least $350 to $400. LGR, hi Clint, asks, what's your favorite non-computing hobby time waster these days? Non-computing. My favorite non-computing hobby. Non-computing, gosh. I can't say console gaming because that involves a computer. Okay, I would say about the only non-computing hobby I have is watching movies, but I have some very specific, strange and eclectic tastes, specifically bad and terrible movies. I love watching horrible movies. And it's for a variety of different reasons, whether it's a vanity project from uh, Neil Breen or uh, Tommy Wiseau, or it's just simply low budget, or it's utterly idiotic uh, story decisions, or uh, cashing in on a fad at the time, like, uh, like what, like Vector Man, I think that's the name of it, which is like this whole stupid virtual reality film with almost no budget and terrible graphics from 1996. I get a certain joy, and I don't want to call it a perverse joy. Um, I think it's more of a joy of they really tried hard, and look how badly they failed, but at least they tried. So, uh, yeah, watching bad movies is one of my one of my hobbies. Dan G asks, "Do you remember Bagels from Heaven? And does anyone still have a copy of it?" That single line involves so much unwrapping, so I'll try to do it as concisely as I can. Bagels from Heaven was my entry into a fast compo. A fast compo is a demo scene competition where you are given a set of rules, sometimes a set of assets, uh, sometimes a theme, and a time limit. And you have to make a demo completely within that time limit following those rules. This fast compo was at uh, a demo party hosted, I want to say, New Year's Eve... 1996. I think that was the second one. It was hosted by Paul Bragel, aka Pyro, who is now a very, very successful venture capitalist and whom you might remember as the person who tried to hack their way into uh, the Olympics. So if you look up Paul Bragel and hack into the Olympics, uh, you'll learn more about him. Um, it was held at his house, uh, and the basement was huge and wonderfully furnished, so we could make as much noise down there as we wanted. So we held a demo party there. Uh, I want to say New Year's Eve 95 and New Year's Eve 96. I think I have those years right. And it was at one of those that we decided to have a fast compo in competition with another demo party that was happening over on the East Coast at the same time. So here were the rules as I remember them. One hour, you could bring one pre-done effect uh, everything else had to be coded at the party. Oh, and you could bring one sound library, because trying to code up an entire mod library at the party in one hour is not practical. And the theme was it had to involve a torus, you know, the traditional 3D donut effect. So we decided to call ours Bagels from Heaven. Leviathan did the music, I did the coding, Pyro did the graphics. It had a voxel landscape in it, which was the effect that I brought. It had a 3D star field of bagels, which was the effect coded at the party. And then I think there was some other thing I coded at the party. I don't really remember. I haven't looked at it in nearly 25 years. And I think we won, everyone voting. Um, the other party's uh, entry was, they did, they took donut literally, and then they had a rotating frosted donut with like sprinkles on it, which I thought was really cool. So, I remember Bagels from Heaven. Does that mean I still have a copy of it? Yes. Link in the description. Am I going to show it to you? No. Link in the description.
Jake S. Del Mastro says, Do you know if there were ever any PC clothes made with SRAM? I wonder how much faster they would be. Uh, actually, yes. Um, early PC laptops were made with SRAM. Um, and they also used the 80C88, the CMOS version of the 8088. And that's because both the 80C88 and SRAM could hold their state as long as you applied uh, power, as long as you applied voltage. They didn't need like, you know, the capacitor refresh like that DRAM needed. So um, a, one good example of this is the IBM convertible. The IBM convertible came with either 256K or 512K of SRAM. And again, it was so that if when you close the lid, it you know the batteries could could clock the CPU down to either nothing or you know one tick per second or something like that. And just by a constant low level of voltage, it would it would hold everything. And then you open up the lid again, and you're still up and running, and you didn't have to uh, reload the system. Are they faster? Uh, not really. Um, as I discussed in the previous Q and A video, the, the the real performance benefit was between five and 10%. Um, I have not yet had the pleasure of running Top Bench, uh, which is a benchmark I wrote on the IBM PC convertible. I would love to do so and see if there is in fact a memory performance differential, but there's probably very little, if any. G412BB has three really long and involved questions. We'll take these one at a time and I'll try to answer as quickly as I can. What is your opinion on current DOS and PC emulators? their quality, and what should be improved or approached differently. I have somewhat unpopular opinions on the current state of DOS and PC emulators um, because I am a perfectionist. As popular as DOSBox is, it is my least favorite emulator for several reasons. Um, it emulates no single machine uh, every instruction takes one cycle. So it is impossible to run a program in DOSBox and have its performance match an actual machine. And as a historical researcher, um, that drives me up the wall. Is it great for just throwing something on and seeing if it works and getting 95% of the way there? Yeah, it is. But when people use DOSBox output as some, as a representative of how this game actually ran, that's where I draw the line, because that game running on DOSBox didn't run on any real machine that way. Another thing that really drives me nuts about DOSBox is that they've stopped updating it practically 10 years ago. There's a lot of stuff constantly contributed to the SVN, but there hasn't been an official release, and people have gotten tired of waiting, and they've put lots of features into their own forks there's DOSBox X, which is actively maintained, and I actually recommend that one. But there's other stuff too, like the SVN and SVN DOM versions. And I mean, there's like 15 different forks of this stuff. Some with uh, the Munt emulator included, some without it, some with ROMs included, some without. And it's that makes it very difficult to tell somebody, go here, do this, and your game will run because there's so many different forks of it all in various states of completion. So the DOSBox ecosystem really frustrates me. The best emulator I recommend to people who want to try to match an exact machine currently is 86box. 86box is a fork of PCEM. I'll leave a link to 86box in the video's description. 86box is the most accurate when it comes to uh, 8088 emulation because it runs an 8088 core developed by one of the 88 miles per hour demo coders, Andrew Jenner, also known as Reenigni. And uh, we created 88 miles per hour to try to spurn people to write better emulators. And when nobody did, we had to do it. <laughs> so Andrew did it, and his core is in 86 box. And as a result, it has the highest compatibility out of any emulator running that demo. But that's not the real reason uh, I recommend it. I recommend it because just overall, it's a great demo. Uh, I mean, it's a great emulator, and um, they uh, don't care at all about the legal ramifications of distributing ROMs, which I'm totally on board with, because if you're emulating systems that are 30, 35, 40 years old, um, a corporation's ability to uh, have any form of economic recovery from shutting 
you down uh, is gone. I mean, you know, the, the Brahm bios of the IBM PC is beyond economic recovery at this point. An 86 box just links you right to a pack full of ROMs. You grab it, you throw it on 86 boxes directory, and you're good to go. Now, the only thing that I don't like about 86 box is that it uh, has no file system integration like DOSBox does. So it's still a very frustrating process to build, put stuff in a floppy disk image or a hard drive image and then mount it in the emulator. And then if you want to add something, you got to shut down the emulator and change the images. That's frustrating. And I hope that someday they'll come up with something, either a, a, a NetBIOS redirector or, um, you know, or file system integration. But in terms of accuracy, uh, 86 box is currently what I'm recommending. Next question. Can you share and show some of your more unique software from your collection or maybe give a tour of your collection? Giving a tour of my collection is a subject for a video all unto itself. So uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, maybe I'll do that in a future video. But uh, can I show some of the more unique software for my collection? I can. So hold on one second and I'll be right back. Well, I'm back. I spent five minutes looking through my collection and pulling out some interesting stuff, at least interesting to me. I don't know if it'll be interesting to you, but let's take a quick look. First of all, of course, uh, Planet X3, which uh, holds a special place in my heart, not merely because it's a really great new production for old machines, but also because I helped write it. And my version has a special note from David Murray written on the manual, so it is very unique to me. Uh, another is Space Racer. So Space Racer is one of the most pirated games for the PC, and probably so pirated that almost nobody has this. Um, Space Racer and Wibarm, and I think one or two other titles uh, from Broderbund in 1988 all had this kind of packaging. Uh, it took me a very long time to find this. Uh, it's in mint condition. There is nothing wrong with the box and it has its original shrink wrap. And that meant a lot to me personally because this title meant a lot to me personally when I was uh, growing up. It demonstrated very long stretches of title music through the PC speaker. Playing any s real sound through the PC speaker was amazing, but this was essentially a one channel mod that with only 96K of data, played music for a good 90 seconds. And so that means a lot to me. One of the rarest things that I have, uh, and it's tangentially game related, is the Graphics Magician. Now, for people on the Apple, this is a very popular, well-known product, and it allows you to create vector graphics, and then you can use those vector graphics in your own productions. And in fact, a lot of games such as Transylvania from uh, Penguin Software, um, used the Graphics Magician. So why is this version, if it was so common on the Apple, why is this version rare? That's because this version is the PC version. There were less than a thousand of these ever made. And uh, when I spoke to Mark Pilzarski, uh, gosh, two decades ago, he barely remembered the PC version and couldn't, you know, couldn't tell me if any had actually ever been sold. Well, clearly one has been sold because I'm holding it. And uh, it's interesting in that it creates graphics that are actually not compatible with the Apple II playback routine. So it's not cross compatible, which is also strange. And even stranger is that although the Graphics Magician came out for the PC, none of Penguin Software's games actually used it. All the graphics in Penguin Software's games, from the Spy series to the PC version of Transylvania and the Crimson Crown, all used graphics made with the Apple II version of Graphics Magician. So, uh, And then finally, we have something that uh, fostered my, my love of programming on the PC uh, at an early age, Icon Quest for the Ring. This is a medieval mythology kind of a game uh, with overhead graphics, but what makes it really special is that it uses a very highly tweaked text mode. Uh, it takes 40 column mode and then it shrinks the cell characters from 8 pixels high to only 2 pixels high. 
And then that way you have these fine rows of text characters on the screen and you can actually use the text characters to make graphics. So it's effectively a 320 by 200 by 16 color graphics mode with a lot of limitations out of a stock standard CGA card. And uh, this is exceedingly rare. Um, I only know of two other people who have this. Mine was unfortunately uh, damaged by the post office. Thanks, post office. Um, but I was very happy to get this. If you've ever seen Icon Demo, uh, that's what this, that's the game that Icon Demo was promoting. Uh, and I also have, uh, almost as rare, its sequel, Seven Spirits of Raw, this time published somewhat properly by Surtek. And, um, it's more of the same, although this time it has an Egyptian mythology bend. And, uh... They're really cool games, and I actually wrote, I actually interviewed uh, the two people who made these games. Uh, they worked under the company called Macrocom, and uh, I will link to that interview uh, in the video's description. Finally, G412BB asks, uh, same as B, but for hardware, show us some of your prized possessions. All right, well, give me a second, and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So I managed to pull three things out that mean a lot to me. Um, and they're also somewhat uncommon, and one in particular is so rare that it's the only known one in the world. Uh, the first thing uh, that I would like to show you is my Periscope board. Periscope was a company that made debuggers for the PC, and they came out with a hardware product called the Periscope board. What, what these boards do is that they've got RAM in them that is non-volatile, so you can load the debugger into the RAM on the card which is then accessible at a memory window location, like at C800 or D1000 or something like that. And it loads it into that RAM, and then it write protects the RAM so that uh, a program couldn't try to overwrite the debugger. And then when you hit the switch, or, you know, here's a, this is a place where a cable comes out and you can have a, a button next to you at the keyboard. When you hit the switch, it uh, triggers the non-maskable interrupt, which then is routed to this card, which then goes to the debugger on the card. This is actually really similar to the game action replay that um, uh, Brandon Cobb uh, donated to LGR and who demonstrated it recently, except that this came out like 10 years earlier and it wasn't meant for uh, you know game cracking, it was meant for legitimate debugging. So the advantage of the board is that pretty much you can debug anything. You can debug um, the boot process. You can debug bootable games. Uh, if the whole system is completely locked up, you can still get into the debugger and do something. Fantastic. I, God, I wish I had this when I was a teenager. I, could have, I would have cracked so much, it would have made your head spin. Uh, the second thing is my... AT&T 6300 Display Enhancement Board. Now there's a lot to this, and it's very involved, so um, I'm not sure how much uh, I can pull out and show you. It's actually a series of cards here. Let's see, let's pull this, I'll just pull out the big one, I guess. Still in a, an electrostatic bag. Uh, the Display Enhancement Board was an early enhanced graphics standard for the Olivetti M24, and uh, it comes with a companion board. I'm not, I have to read the instructions. I'm not sure if this is uh, to be installed alongside it or, uh, or something, but um, it installs and, com and complements the display adapter inside an Olivetti M24 or 6300 or similar. And what the DEB does is it creates sort of EGA-like graphics, so, uh, the Olivetti M24 can display 640 by 400 in two colors. With a DEB, it can do that in 16 colors. It can also mix text and graphics together, and it also has a cute little feature where you can define a pixel as two of the available 16 text colors, and it will flick between them at, a, at an interval up to the refresh rate of the monitor. Um, blinking doesn't seem very useful, but at the refresh rate of the monitor does seem useful because uh, for certain combinations that don't flicker too badly, you can essentially have more colors. The big feature that they were touting really was the mixture of text and graphics uh, for presentations, but um, I just want to see uh, if I can get that color thing going. 
Um, very few programs supported the Display Enhancement Board. Uh, it's exceedingly, it, it didn't sell hardly at all. And um, the only programs I know of that really supported are things like, uh, I think Gem has an adapter for it, and uh, Dr. Halo, and or PC Paint. And I think that's it. And then, the my, probably my favorite piece of hardware, and the rarest thing that I own, and there's only one of these known in the world, is the aforementioned PC Mocking Board, AKA the Bank Street Music Writer Card. And I will show it to you, because that's why you're here. The Bank Street Music Writer Card is a mocking board on a card. I just gotta make sure this wheel isn't coming off. Um, it is two uh, GI, a, it is two AY3 8913 chips, same as the mocking board. So it's capable of six voices in mono, not stereo. And uh, it, it, can, it can, out of those six voices, they can either be square wave tones with I think a 16 level volume or it can be uh, the noise generator, which had a uh, an envelope mode and white noise. Effectively, listen to any Apple II mocking board stuff and you'll hear what this board can do. In fact, Bank Street Music Writer was ported to the Apple II, now that I think about it, and supports the mocking board on that platform. So honestly, you could probably hear the exact same thing. But this is an ISA card and it's mine. Now, why do I have this? Did I pay tens of thousands of dollars for it? No, I was a teenager in 1986 when this thing came out and I begged my friend who worked at a computer store to apply his employee discount and I gave him a hundred bucks and he came back with Bank Street Music Writer because like I said, as a teenager, I really wanted to make music with the IBM PC. So this board, um, it, both this board and the AdLib came out in the same year. The AdLib is much more of a functional music composition system, obviously. And in fact, that's how it was exclusively marketed uh, for like the first two years of its life until game developers finally started using it for games. Um, but yeah, the Bank Street Music Writer card. I must have written almost, I must have written or transcribed at least 60 tunes on that thing. Gargai asks, I thought of another fun thing that could be fun to talk about, hard drive parking. I remember from the olden days having to run park.com just before you shut the PC down because the drives didn't self-park the head and would damage the drive if you didn't. Seems quaint now and probably worth a mention just for the curiosity factor. I agree. So in the early, early days of hard drives, meaning before I was born, like the late 1960s, hard drives were, they were made out of huge platters and were very heavy and had very, uh, they generated a lot of gravitational force when they spun. And uh, if the arm came down into the platter, not only did you run the risk of losing your data, but like massive damage to humans and equipment could occur. So when they were moved, they had a position to park the heads, a parking area. And you would manually move these heads and then like, I'm not kidding, like latch a bolt on the bottom of the unit to lock the arms in place so that you could move the unit without damaging it. Later on, when hard drives became small enough to fit into desktop computers, you know, think late 70s in the Shugart area of drives, parking still needed to be done, but this was no longer a user operation. The drives were stuck inside the machine. So how do you park the heads before you move a hard drive? You run a little program and the program moves the heads all the way to the end. Now the proper way to do parking is all MFM and RLL drives and I think a lot of early SCSI drives too, they actually have an extra cylinder called the engineering cylinder. So the drive could state that it had, you know, 913 cylinders, but in fact it had 914. And the engineering cylinder was where you were, it was like a scratch cylinder. You were supposed to be able to use it for testing low level formatting, or as scratch space for, you know, if you wanted to move something off of a cylinder, screw with the cylinder and then move it back. The engineering cylinder was there for you for that. And that is also typically where you were supposed to park the heads because if the heads did crash down, you were only damaging the engineering cylinder and not the previous cylinders where your data actually was. That's what 
Park Dot com is supposed to do and what all other prior programs like this. In fact, actually, programs prior to park.com used to be called ship, ship.com, because you would run that prior to shipping the machine somewhere else. Uh, park.com, very specifically, uh, if I'm thinking of the same one, is the version that was included with Spinrite. And uh, it was popular to throw around because it was a tiny 510 byte program that fit in a single sector didn't have any copyright notices and uh, wasn't copy protected. So park.com from Spinrite is probably the one that you remember running. Does it go to the uh, engineering cylinder and park the heads there? I've never actually disassembled it. So let's disassemble it right now and take a look. Okay, so I've taken park.com and from Spinrite 2 and I've put it into IDA and disassembled and commented it a little bit. And uh, it doesn't take very long to see that it's doing in fact what it should be doing. Uh, first, uh, through an N13 call, it gets the current drive parameters, which includes the number of cylinders, which it doesn't state so in this comment, but are actually, the number of cylinders are stored in CH. Then, uh, after adjusting for whether or not it should say you have dr a drive or drives, um, down here you can see it incrementing CH, which is increasing the number of cylinders reported by one, and then it issues another N13 call to seek to a specific cylinder. So it looks like it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It grabs the total number of cylinders and then tries to seek to one past that so that the heads are landing on the engineering cylinder. And then uh, another nice thing that park.com does is that it uh, waits for a key press before exiting to DOS. And that's wise because DOS allows you to set the prompt to something like, um, I mean, the common prompt is, um, dollar sign P, dollar sign G, which is the path and then the greater than symbol. And if you, you could get yourself in a situation where uh, hitting a key and going back to DOS would run through that prompt and because the prompt says what's the current directory, it is very possible that a hard drive seek could occur to retrieve that information and now your heads aren't parked anymore. So park.com waits for a key press uh, so that you can run it and then immediately hit the power so that you know that your heads are still parked. So uh, very short, sweet, to the point, competent program. I love that. Thanks for all the questions. These videos are really fun for me to make. More importantly, they help me get out content in a regular release schedule, which is important to people who want to see more from me. Um, helps me not get stuck in a rut. So I appreciate the questions. If you have any questions that you'd like me to answer about the demo scene or software preservation or anything within the scope of things that I'm known for, please feel free to leave a comment in this video's description and hopefully I'll be able to get to it in next month's Q&A video. Um, if you'd like to support what I'm doing, I have a Patreon link in the description if you'd like to check that out. There's a little bit of exclusive content there as well. And uh, until next time, uh, as you can see, we're all getting shaggier because of self-quarantine, so I'll say the same thing. Please be safe, uh, be well, and thank you for watching.